welcome to Rock Code Live. I am your host, Rock Code. Today, we're going to be taking a look at second state. We're going to be playing with a combination of functions as a service, Rust, Node.js, and some random other bits and pieces thrown in together. Joining me today, we have Tim McCallum from Second State Project. Hey, Tim, how hey. are you doing? Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, my pleasure. Uh, I, I always love it when I get to play with WebAssembly, so I'm really excited to kind of kick the tires on Second State and see what we can do with it today. Perfect. Should Sounds we start good. by you giving us a small introduction into yourself, and then we'll talk about Second State in a little bit more detail. Yeah, sure. So uh, developer for Second State, we have uh, developers all around the world, uh, in China, Taiwan, uh, the States. Um, at the moment, we're working on a, a variety of different projects, um, some blockchain, some WebAssembly, um, very much at the um, virtual machine level and um, the blockchain VM um, work that we've done in the past <clears throat> ties in really nicely with the WebAssembly VM work. And um, last year, uh, Michael and I, we went over to the first uh, WebAssembly summit at uh, Google headquarters there in Silicon Valley. So that was really interesting, really great. And um, since then, we've just come back and just been powering on, uh, developing a whole bunch of different uh, software applications and uh, tooling and tool chains and um, really uh, taking it uh, to the server side as well. So working uh, with WebAssembly on the server side and creating a function as a service uh, for the open web. So like a cloud agnostic function as a service that anybody can call just uh, over the web using secure HTTP requests. And that means um, so compiling and launching code as well as executing it, um, deleting it, updating it, like hot swapping it live in production. Um, probably touching it um, fairly soon, but um, the WebAssembly VM is obviously a sandbox. You know, it's got some advantages um, that it uh, works in a sandbox environment, so it's safe to run untrusted code, etc. But also has some interesting nuances, like it's stateless. There's no storage, um, doesn't have strings. You know, like the four data types. It's basically integers and things like that. So um, we've worked really hard to try and bring together a whole ecosystem. And I'm um, I'm essentially part of the um, the Open API, which is a function as a service, which we could um, have a, a good look at today. That'd be that'd be really cool. All right, excellent. What do you think some of the, what are the main use cases for someone who would be wanting to adopt second state? What, what problems would they be trying to solve? So probably the, the one uh, that would relate to the work I do is traditionally you have, um, you want to build a web application or a website, something with a little bit of functionality. You'd essentially have to go through and create the LAMP stack, you know, so you've got the, the Linux and Apache and PHP and you'd have MySQL and then you've got all these issues around, um, you know, setting up the database, um, all the security aspects of that, um, doing all your IP tables on the server, installing the server software. Um, and in any institution, you're, you're essentially running, um, you know, like you've got a security team and those guys are doing all of the work to secure the network and to um, maintain all the firewalls and the servers and things like that. And what we do is we take away all of that and we just offer a function as a service, um, but not in a proprietary cloud environment um, where you have like this proprietary, you know, username and login and dashboards or any sort of um, user authentication, access control, all those sorts of things. We throw all that out the window and we just give you a um, an, an API endpoint, essentially like a REST, RESTful API. Um, so you can stand up a website in five minutes, like highly functional, you know, doing things like um, facial recognition, uh, image classification. Um, I, your previous videos there where you did the anagram solver and things, I've turned that into a, an API in a few minutes and deployed that. So the um, this jam stack, I don't know if you've talked about that a fair bit, but so the Java API and markup, um, that's a really um, cool framework. So essentially the problem we're solving is we're, just saying you can just use the Jamstack. So you can have some HTML, maybe one JavaScript function, and you call one of the APIs and you're off to the races. You've got a, a fully functioning uh, web application on the open web with no infrastructure. So it's like a zero infrastructure. You can even open it statically on your PC. Uh, and <clears throat> you just, you know, say you we'll, might do this a bit later, 
um, you know, you click a button that fires off a JavaScript function that calls an API and returns a result. And you can just do that all, even if it's just statically on your system. So there's no servers, there's no hosting, there's no security, no databases, all that stuff. It's all by the by. Nice. All right. Let's tackle a couple of the comments. So first, we got a wash hands thumbs up. Thanks, Miley. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Vignesh is saying, what is second state really? I, I think we just covered that, uh, hopefully. Um, and we're about to get hands on with it. So you'll see it in action. And hopefully that will answer any of the other questions that you have. But feel free to add more comments if you need. And uh, hello from Cube Daily. Hey, Cube. So can we think of second state as a... You know, you said there's no infrastructure. I just need to write my functions that gets compiled to Wasm, and then I deploy them to second state. Essentially, like a like you know, if I were writing a JavaScript application, I may throw it to Netlify or to Versal. Second state is yeah. that, but for WebAssembly, my understanding there. Correct. Oh, awesome. Yes, that's right. So the, the the function execution is done on a, a standalone uh, VM, a WebAssembly VM. So second state uh, itself is much broader that the company second state inc we do a lot of blockchain work um you see on the website there which we'd probably pop over and visit in a sec yep. um we have a lot of affiliations with some some large projects in the blockchain space and um, so there's a fair bit <clears throat> to go through on the site there what what i'm mainly um, working on at the moment um is the function as a service which is the serverless tab up there and um if you click on the blockchain tab or the other tabs you'll see the other projects that we're working on we're going full steam ahead in, in a lot of directions. So um, probably too much to cover in, in one call, but we can certainly <laughs> look at the function as a service, um, the serverless stuff today. But yeah, a lot of work in the VM space, um, machine learning, AI, um, the building uh, blockchain VM for other really high profile projects. Um, and it's all open source? There's no proprietary bits or is it a mix? Yeah, yeah. Every free and open source, the GitHub repository is just full of all of our work uh, from the developers in China, Taiwan, America, Australia. Yeah. Nice. Well, let's kick the tires on this then. Let's see if we can get okay. some functions deployed. Sure. Uh, is the best yeah. place to start clicking on serverless and then get started? Um, yeah, I guess the, the yeah, I, I maybe just suggest a couple of things. Um, if we just primarily look at the function as a service, stuff today Mm -hmm. if you have a um like your code editor if we just open up like a blank page i just recommend that whilst we work through this we'll just use that as like a like a chalkboard to just paste some text in so we can come back to it and i'll show you how when we launch code it gives you like an id which you then use that id to call the code and things like that so we just have like a blank um sketch pad if you will up um the I'll send you through a link, which is the raw code live stream links. There's a API there. If you just click on that API docs, we might start there. That's okay with you sort of jump straight in and. Yep. yep. So this repository is just on github.com slash TP McCallum. Uh, the link will be in the description afterwards, but feel free to check it out at your own leisure. And here we have, so this is like the open API generated Documentary. Yeah. yeah yeah so just recently entered this um into the uh, postman api hack and the name i came up with was jam packed because we just talked about the javascript api and markup and this really is jam packed you can do everything with this you can essentially write rust source code compile it to WebAssembly, and launch it and then call it so your application can be as wild as what you can come up with essentially um and we can do a bit of that today so if we scroll down here uh, this gives you a bit of an intro into it's like an overview but if we just jump straight into the uh, api calls here the first one there that get request uh is yeah that guy there if we uh, just on the right you can see the curl command so if you paste that into your terminal and hit enter if that's okay with you like we just yeah is that my computer so infected with some crazy wasm virus? Yeah. <laughs> I was a bit too so trusting these, there, I think, with that curl. <laughs> <laughs> so these are all, so we're just doing um, secure HTTP requests. So those are all of the um, wasm IDs that are in the system. So when we deploy one, it sends you back an ID. Um, and so if you go down a little bit further, we've got the the next one there. I oh, actually go down a, a couple. When you deploy a an executable you can actually get back a 
wasm sha 256 hash so if we paste the 256 hash filter by into the terminal so it's um, oh no i think i just need to oh no that's we escaped the um, i think we escaped the square brackets with the backslash i think that would resolve that yeah i think that's okay. cool so what that's doing is returning you a hash of the executable code that you deployed and this is good because say you're using somebody else like say i do a celsius to fahrenheit conversion or something like that and i just want to share that with the world if i know that the sha 256 is that then my i can programmatically check that either before and after i call so if anybody changes like if the owner of the executable code changes the any part of the code then it will create a completely different hash and then i will know oh hang on i'm not actually calling the function i intended now it's something different so we can cover that off in a bit so does that mean um, so if, I deploy, feature, yeah. <laughs> if i deploy a, if i deploy a function on second state yep. it's publicly available for 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 everybody correct and you can also when you deploy it make it only available to you exclusively so 100 percent private by just putting in a um in the header you just uh it'll it'll create a usage key and if you don't have that key then you can't use it or see it or anything like that so and the the feature of this is if you go if you make it public actually we can do this if you want yeah let's do it we'll, we'll launch one yeah cool okay so let's do let's do a hello world so if we head on over to uh, probably back to that GitHub file that I sent you. If you go to demos, uh, let's just click on any one of those. De oh, just hang on a sec. I'll just. Sorry, if you just go to github.com forward slash second hyphen state. com second state yep second hyphen state yeah and then go just scroll down and click on the it's wasm learning so just in the middle there wasm learning yep and then if you look down there there's a folder called f as function as a service if you click on that guy yep and we might just do hello so this is essentially just a hello world example. Yeah. And if we scroll down there, you have Rust installed already, right? I um, do, yes. Okay. So if you just scroll up a tiny bit, there is a little message that says that you install Rust and SSVM up. So if you click on that SSVM up link, we'll just quickly go ahead and install that. This is a tool chain essentially for the second state function as a service. So uh, it's just that, yeah, that bottom guy there, if you paste that in minus the dollar sign at the start, that will automatically install for you. Pape into a shell live on the stream. <laughs> I get into mm. trouble for that all the time by my audience. Uh, VM up. All right. Okay. And so what we do is if we go and Git clone the Wasm learning repo onto your system, then we'll have access to all of those demos. Yep, that's it. All right, let's refresh. Okay. Not done yet. Oh, no, it's quite big. Give it a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. Almost there. Uh, got a yo from Jared. Hey, from the welcome to an introduction to second state. <laughs> All right, I think we're almost there. So yeah, we've got Faz, and we're going into hello. Yep. This is a Rust project with yep, yep. Hello world. Right. It's just hello world. Yeah. So we could kick off with this. So if you go to your terminal and go into that hello directory. Yep. Yep. And once you're in there, if you just type SSVM up as one word and then 
build, so space build, yep. That will get that ready for you. So this is going to do a Rust compilation of the project with a target of WASM. There's nothing magic about that at the moment, right? And then the SSVM yeah, that's, part, that's... is that uploading it to the second state? No, it's Ooh. just compiling it ready for you, yeah. Uh, do we need a rest up add target wasm32 vazi? Uh, no, no. This will this will do it. Okay, let's see what the oh, error was. Like <laughs> oh, I don't have it's a okay. CC compiler. Okay. Let's install GCC. hope homebrew is feeling quick today which it rarely ever is um i'm sure there's a oh, fact i know what's going on have you got in your home directory have you got a target set in your cargo.com file i think that might be it it's actually trying to use because you might have done you might have compiled some web assembly on this system already or something uh, i can't um, remember how to check that is it that's the tool chain. Target list. Oh, there's a whole bunch. Okay, so you think there's a target set of my cargo right now. Is there a way I can just get rid of that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just have a look. Uh, see if I can remember how to do this. So I have compiled WebAssembly before. So is that potentially? Okay. Yeah, uh, I think you've got a um, you've got one set there to to use that other target, whereas we're just, we're doing this through SSVM up. Um, Let's see, what can I do? Should I just remove these? Remove WASM32 yeah, yeah. Vazi. Yeah. The other two aren't installed. Let's see if that helps. Yeah. So it's now downloading that target. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, wait, invalid active developer path. Ooh. That's that weird Xcode thing, isn't it? Ugh. Okay. Okay. See, it's it's always my oh, one hour, 30 minutes. You know, that bear speed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll just sit and watch it. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's going quick. I think we should be okay. I actually did. Oh, my Mac's always popping up asking me to install updates, and I let it. I let it do it last night, and I'm assuming that's just right. X Club uh -huh. just needs that little nudge now. So, okay, sure. So it's quite late for you, right? You're in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, be midnight soon. Um, <laughs> this should take us up to midnight. Yeah. Well, thank it's... you for <laughs> staying up late yeah. and joining me. That's uh no it's a pleasure yeah i don't get to drink coffee and eat dark chocolate this late so it's been a treat <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been trying to my coffee consumption is through the roof but i've been trying to get better by switching to decaf and I oh, think yeah. the, the taste is well decaf after 2 p.m and i think the taste is all right but i think mentally i know that it's decaf so i just grudge it a little bit yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like i want the caffeine so. mm. mac is always wildly inaccurate with its time frames as well isn't it yeah yeah it grows 
it seems to have settled on four minutes. So why don't we take a look at some of these other examples for the time being? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so see those, in fact, uh, I'm going to throw something wild out. When we ran that curl command, we got a list of a whole bunch of WASI IDs. Can, can we yeah. run one of them? Can we use one of uh, these? Yeah. yeah, we absolutely can. So let's do... Um, Oh, actually, I'll tell you what I'll do real quick. Um, we'll, we'll sort of jump to the front end uh, because we're, we're compiling stuff now and then pushing it in. So let's actually have a look at what it would look like. So if you go back to that GitHub page, um, there'll be some demos. Uh, so there's demos there like the the image processing is probably a good one to, to start looking at just to explain like this holistically. And I'll just show you one other thing too. If you go back to the um, GitHub page again, there's a logs section. Um, and did I put it in there somewhere? Uh, so look. Um, right here, this one, right? Log. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's that's not HTTPS. It's only HTTP. Oh, you've got it. Okay, cool. So this will essentially um, I've created a like a forward facing log. Um, so when you run, uh, it'll actually give you the output of the execution from the server, but it's pumping it out into your browser. So you've got some indication of what's going on. So what we can do is you can just refer back to that whenever you feel like it. If we go to the uh, the demo there. So this just wants me to upload an image and then I can do some weird modifications with it. Yeah, so, so I've got an example of an image there. If you just oh. right click open new tab of that, um, that example link, yeah, and then just save that to your desktop or wherever, and we'll, we can use that guy. All right, so we select the browse, select that. Cowboy. Find that guy. Yeah, that's it. All right, so we. So can... if you click like in any of those buttons, we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. And if you have a if you have a look at the log file there that we've got open, you'll see that when that executes, it calls um, wasm ID 273. And so basically, if you just click any of those buttons, it will just keep calling and doing uh, the image processing. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we can, we can go have a look. Actually, if you just right click and view source, because that's like a, a really, um, simple page so what we've got is a javascript function up the top there if you see that i think it's called call service and so this is the the j in the jam stack so all we're doing is we're calling uh, the url there rpc.ssvm.second state that's where we're actually you know the curl command before that we we're actually just using that same that's the endpoint and so what we're doing here is we're saying We've got a multi-part form data and we want to run a function. It's at wasm ID of X and the function name is called flip or rotate or whatever. And this particular one on the end is slash bytes because we're, we're dealing um, exclusively in just in raw bytes here. So we're sending a, an image through uh, to the to the endpoint and it's processing it using the Rust, which is compiled to WebAssembly, and then it's sending it back as bytes. And then the, the browser's rendering those bytes as an image. So we're just running it in its native um, image uh, as as bytes, and so that's the J. That, that that's the only JavaScript essentially. And if you scroll down to the buttons, I've just made a bunch of different buttons there, and each button obviously has got a different name. You know, flip, rotate, whatever. And so when we click on that, they're all calling call service, but they're just passing in the appropriate wasm ID. So to, to go back to your thing before, like what if we called one of those that they're all calling the relevant wasm IDs. So obviously those are all public at the moment. And if you wanted to have your own custom wasm anything, um, you could deploy it and make it private. So very cool. I, I, I like that. I mean, there was this idea. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I think it was like 10 years ago uh, where Google mm -hmm. tried to launch something called web intents which was this uh -huh. idea that you could deploy functions to the web and they would reveal their intent. Like, 
like similar to android does it so you say hey this function is available at this url and it satisfies an intent called crop image and it exposes right. an API that anyone can call right. and then your, your application can just say, hey, I want to resize an image and it would find the intent yeah. from the system and do it. This feels like this yeah. could be a really important part of actually making that a real thing. Like where if the second yeah. state VM and, and the hosting provider infrastructure and functions, yeah. really cool way to connect the dots there. So I like this. Yeah. All right, let's see if so, we've at least yep. satisfied this as well just now. Well, that looks a bit better. It's actually compiling. That looks a bit better. <laughs> now we just have oh. to deal with Cargo being the slowest compiler in the world, but or sure. Rusty being the slowest compiler in the world. Yeah, um, yeah that's very that was... cool. I like this. And it's really, the fact that it's exposed over a, just a really basic HTTP REST style or RPC API yeah. makes it really convenient right. and easy to integrate into my application as well. I love that. that yeah, is... super easy. Yeah. yeah. So, you, you know, you can, uh, if you go back to when, phones came out you know and we had like programming the web and apps and things like that i think creating apps it's, it's a really difficult framework to work with you've got all these different languages and frameworks and then you've got two different phone companies and you have to like build an app for each one and then if you have an update you have to um you know basically tell the people oh the, the app's been updated and then they have to pull an update onto their phone and it's just to me that's it's super clunky um this is just using the web as the web is intended. So if we have one of these WASM IDs, you can even hot swap. So if you want to do an update, um, because, you know, obviously we're doing image processing here, but it could be literally anything. It could be accounting packages or, um, you know, IoT stuff or whatever. Say you want to you change your business rules or what have you and you want to do an update, you just recompile your WASM. You don't relaunch it. You just do a put request. So it's the same endpoints as RESTful. And when you do the put request, it'll update the new executable code and then when that function executes, it now does the new thing. But the user is oblivious. They don't need to know. It just does what it's supposed to do. Now, obviously, from an application point of view, you've got that hash. So if there was a security issue where you didn't want to run a hash that you didn't know, that's fine. So that's like an inbuilt security mechanism. But um, at the end of the day, you can create an app in a few minutes just using HTML and JavaScript. And, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's super clean. It's all open, free. Uh, on the web yeah there's well, no sort of proprietary <laughs> roadblock yeah so i've got i've got two questions and there's one from jared in the chat that'll pop up in just a minute sure. so firstly yeah. can can anyone override what the function does as an id could i could i replace id 372 just now uh you can if you have the if you're the owner but you right. can't if you're not the owner so i guess if if that's built let's go ahead and <laughs> build it and, and launch it and then i'll show you how that works it's it's really straightforward how this works it's super simple okay so it looks like it built okay oh cool okay so in the um pkg folder if you just do an ls on the pkg folder you'll see that there's a hello lib vg wasm now um probably the best way to do this is to go back to the um uh, instructions so that readme file where we were before for the hello and it'll show you how to deploy it so yeah, just back to that GitHub page with the hello. Yeah, and so there is a, so what we're doing here is we're doing a post request and we're sending it to that RPC. And so that's all pre-filled actually. If you paste that in, that'll work because it knows that's a hello underscore lib underscore BG. You send that off. Yep. And I get an ID back. Cool. So if you grab all of that, that's just a JSON response. If you just take that, remember we talked about having a blank, like a, a whiteboard. We just, let's just post that into your blank file and for, for future reference. Yep. Yep. And so there was an ID now is three, two, seven for the hello. And there's your, your hash and there's a bunch of other information, but let's not worry about that for now. Oh, actually just, if you could, um, prettify that or just scroll to the right, we'll have a look at the, um, SSVM admin key. Uh, yep. Let's just see if this is main dot js. Oh. Uh, oh, I didn't like it. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. All right, I'll just scroll for now. Not yeah, sure just why go it's going. Fine. Yeah, so we'll just have a look at the SSVM usage key. You'll see that that's zeroed out, 
and that means that anybody can use it. And so the admin key, which is the next one coming along, which is sent back. Yep. Yep. The admin key is what you would use in the headers if you wanted to change something um, like um, do a put and, and update the code. So a couple of things we could do. We could, one, we could hack the hello and say raw code says hello or something and then redeploy it. Um, at the same WASM ID and then see the SHA-256 change. Would, shall we do that real quick? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're going to modify this. We want it to say yeah. hello from raw code live. And then SSVM yeah. build. Yep. And then I, I just had the same curl command. I need to pass in my ID. So, Yep. So what we do now, um, if we go to the uh, that API, that Jamstack API thing I sent through, uh, oh, it's probably. Yeah. Oh, actually, there might be an example in here oh, to do a put instead of a post. Yeah, maybe just. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe just head over to the Jamstack um, API. Yep. Yep, and. Probably the first put there. Uh, Fun. Up, update oh, yeah. your code. There we go. Yeah, so there we go. So um, obviously we need to tweak that a little bit. So maybe just put that in your blank file so we can, or whatever you want. Yep. <laughs> so what we're doing is um, the WASM ID needs to be the correct. Yep. And then so application octet stream, that's cool. We need to whack the admin key in there. So that gives us the power to do this. I hope yep. nobody watching the stream has updated it already. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, all yeah, right, cool. and then we just update. We'll, we'll delete there. it when we finish, <laughs> and then obviously the correct <laughs> yeah, it wasn't for. Hello, BG. Yeah, pop that in. I think that's all good. Oh. Uh, uh, that should be package. Oh yeah, package. Yeah. Ta -da. Yep. So if you grab that and just pop that in the blank file, so same wasm ID three two seven, new SHA two fifty six hash. Yep. Yep. Great. Same admin key and the usage key will also be zeroed out. So now if we run that by calling it, so if we go back to the um, API. Or, or actually even to the, yeah, to here is fine because it'll be in this these yeah, instructions. Like, so yeah, we want to do, yeah, down the bottom there and just Update tweak the, the um, wasn't ID. Yeah. Oh, I broke it. Let's try again. Three, two, seven. Yeah. There we Welcome go. From Raw Code Lives. Yeah, cool. All right, so now what we can do is it's public at the moment, so we want to now change our mind and lock it down. So what we do is we hit a different endpoint, and if we go back to the API docs, and so just to reiterate, everything that we do is all RESTful API. There's no logging into service whatsoever. It's all just done through this open web calls. Uh, so we want to do a... I'll just have a look on mine. Um, my screen's a bit bigger here. So if we go down to yeah. So down, I think it's like the last put in that the last put down there. Yep. There is a API keys usage key. Yeah, right. and if we put yeah, put the correct WASM ID in there, and then the admin key. Yeah. So, so that's generated us a non-zeroed out usage key. So now if you don't have that key in the headers, it won't work. And But that's super easy to put that in the headers. So if we want to call that again, yeah. All right. Uh, yep. where's the call this one yeah. and so we want to add a header so dash dash header on a new line oh. 
uh, what's the header called? Uh, with um, uh, so capital S S V M. So capital S, capital S, capital V. Uh, let me just find it. Okay, just one second. SSVM underscore usage underscore key. Yeah, that's the one. Yep. That's the key. And okay, cool. and then the value is the. Yep. Uh, oh, because I got the format wrong. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> it worked. Okay, cool. And so obviously we can see that if, if you don't have the key, it's not going to let you do it. Now, when you create when you launch the executable the first time, if you want it to create a key for you and you don't have to go through this process of having it open and then closing it, you just put, um, there's a parameter there, which is um, like SSVM key, and then you put true, and then it will be private right from the get go. Now you can refresh the key. So say you do like a class or a hackathon or something, and you want to like reset it, you can run that command we just did, and it'll generate a new key. So it doesn't necessarily have to be zeroed out. It can just create another key. So you can like flush if there's a cohort of students or something, you can flush that executable and kick them off and then give the new, the new cohort, the new key and that sort of thing. Or you can just open it right up and zero it out. Yeah. Yeah. I changed it. Yeah. So fairly simple, all just done with some simple calls. Okay. So that's, so I'm curious then, right? Like, yeah. Uh, and Jared, I've not forgot your question. I'll get to it in just 10 seconds, but mm -hmm. I'm not giving you any money. I'm deploying functions onto the web that I can then use. Are there um, usage limits before I start having to pay? Or what are they? Yeah. Uh, like, how, yeah. how does that work? So, it, it, so it's rate limited at the moment. And I've just set it to some like arbitrary, like a hundred requests a, a minute or something like that. Um, so what we do, I'll talk, I'll talk about this really quickly, but it's a it's a whole nother uh, subject. But in the in the blockchain space, you know, there's this notion of gas. Like in Ethereum, um, the the EVM has gas, and so you want to perform a transaction, so you give it some gas, and it goes ahead, and the miners mine, and they make a profit, and these sorts of things. We have that same infrastructure on the WebAssembly VM, we, where we have this notion of gas. So we have a statistics um, section which is implemented on on here, and it will, depending on what the computation is, it will charge you um, a point system. So it's essentially like um, calculating um, compute and the gas is a number. And so ultimately it's a only pay for what you use system. It's very efficient. So there's no like monthly subscriptions or any sort of costs. Um, so really brilliant for a, a business model for if you were a web developer and you wanted to create an app and do some like, you know, uh, image recognition, like plant recognition or something. There's all this functionality in the Rust that I can show you later where we do um, some machine learning and AI stuff. Um, you would pay like fractions of a cent per piece of gas or whatever. But if no one's using your app, you're not paying anything. But as soon as they use your app, then the gas is being calculated. So there's a, there's a good business model you could take to investors and say, um, you know, if the app's dead for 48 hours, we're not being billed. And so it's different to a cloud provider where you've got any sort of infrastructure that you're um, holding on to and paying for when you're not actually using it. It's strictly a pay, pay for what you use um, architecture, yeah. yeah Which is the sense. best way we can to do it. Yeah, it's it's kind of the ultimate way. Okay, well that you mentioned ML there and I'll, I'll bring in Jared's question, which was yeah. uh, <laughs> correlated quite nicely. But he asked us, you know, is this mainly used for ML functions? Uh, I guess I would pivot that a little bit. I mean, do you see people using this for machine learning workloads? Yeah, I'll show you a really cool demo. Um, go back to the um, the raw code links. I just did this one the other day. I thought it was really interesting. If you go up, there's a OCR and language translation demo. Mm -hmm. And I really love this one because this has actually happened. You know, you go to a restaurant and so if you save that as like you have a, a French restaurant and you have no idea and the waiter wants you to order and you, you honestly don't know. And so you point at something and you get something you don't want. It's kind of funny. And I've been, I've been caught in places 
downloading apps and you know it's kind of ruining the experience because you're trying to do the language translation i've done this so many times myself i'm sat there with my phone trying to get a picture and get yeah. it and get it to translate yeah. it for me yeah. so. so so we just knocked this up the other day this is like a super simple web app um if we right click and view source you'll see that but basically what it's done is it's taken your image it's on one hand there's a there's a function as a service endpoint there which we can see in the source code it'll have a wasm id and it has taken the actual letters out of the image and turned them into characters. And then there's a second function call, which um, converts the language to the language of your choice. And so now we have the menu in plain English. Very cool. I like that one. Yeah, using, using TensorFlow. Uh, so you can go ahead and train to do whatever you want. We have like birds and food. And there's one where I have a video and you play the video and it'll tell you what the pizza topping is and stuff like that. So we're just building the infrastructure though. These are just like prototypes, demos of what you could use it for to create your app. And then once you get that user base, then you pay for what you use and it makes your app attractive to Is a code for this. Can we take a look at that? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So if we start off by right click view source, we'll have, just have a look at the, the basic bare bones of the, the jam. Um, so there's a function there. Um, I Thing. Yeah, so it's fairly straightforward, the JavaScript. So it's just that call service again. And it's multi-part form data as well. And if you can see there, we've got the um, wasm ID of 284. And one of the functions is called OCR. And then the next one below that, a few lines down, is, is also 284. And it's called translate. So we can pop over and have a look at that Rust, which compiled to WebAssembly and was executed on the VM. So I think that is uh, in. Let's see. OCR? Yeah, I think if you go to OCR, open up that. Yeah, that's it. So I've deployed that. I've done an SSVM up build and deployed that, and it's come back with that wasm ID. So that's the, the Rust code that will execute. Sorry, that will compile to WebAssembly. That'll execute. <laughs> Yeah, yeah the, the code jump there from Hello World to OCR with TensorFlow. Yeah. <laughs> <just went, laughs> uh, yeah. I don't need to understand that, but I like what it does. So that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a question from Vignesh who's asking Is there a timeout for the function execution? No, not at this moment. So I could yeah. write a function that takes 30 seconds, five minutes, and that'll run quite happily in SSVM. Yeah. I might, I might actually show you something. Um, one of the powerful things about this and one of the reasons why we built this is because a lot of technology in the hand of users is moving from powerful machines to smaller and smaller light clients, thin clients, you know, phones, IoT devices and that sort of thing. And what we've done is taken as much of the heavy lifting and all the processing and um, storage and memory and all that stuff and we've taken that off the end user like the client and we've moved that across to the second state infrastructure so we've come up with ways that we can actually stop functions from taking too long essentially if you use the infrastructure as it's intended your function should never really take that long um, like this is a great example we're doing some really powerful um, processing here in fractions of a second essentially and so this this is very quick where we find it's um, slow is if i have a giant image that I need to upload from my tiny phone on my very poor bandwidth and then process it and then send the whole, that that's actually a bottleneck, but it's, it's not really the system. It's more like my bandwidth and my device. So I could show you something really cool. We can do a remote fetch of an image. So you know how we're doing the image manipulation before? Mm -hmm. What we can do is we can hack the, say like the thumbnail demo. Mm -hmm in the wasp learning and instead of us uploading you know you opened it on your system and then it sent it to the server and back what we can do is we can get it to go and remote fetch an image so it's not actually using your bandwidth and then it processes it and then it sends you back a thumbnail right, so to clarify like to instead of a browse button here we'd have a text box yeah and take a url exactly. and then, okay yeah yeah, that's right. So if we go to a different one, because that's sort of like a holistic um, demo, if we go to the Wasm Learning and the Fast and maybe click, there's an image thumbnail, like image hyphen thumbnail. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Um, oh, right. So Over just here. in the GitHub uh, <laughs> second state. Yep. So in there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so in the HTML section of that folder, so we're in the Rust source code now. If we go into the HTML, open this guy up, we can go and do a bit of a hack down below. So instead of in the form, instead of the, uh, where is it? Instead of the, the input type being file, we can change type equals text. So just switch out the word file for text, that, that would work. And then um, that's probably all we need there. So then in a Rust where we get the base received right now, we're... That, that'll be okay. We don't need to touch that. Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to allow the HTML to tell second state, hey, I'm not giving you an image. I want you to go get it yourself and then do stuff to it and don't use my bandwidth. So if we uh, if we go up to, we'd have to do one more thing in the HTML to make that work. So if we go up um, to the form where we actually have the form data and it says form data dot append input underscore one, and then it's passing in the actual file. What we do is we take away that and we would exchange that for something like document dot get, you know, dot value or whatever. So we're actually going to take the text out of the, the input text and use the text instead of the file. I'll just do a quick Google for that. Um, Okay, so it'd be like document dot get element by ID value one or oh, input one, sorry, yeah, and then um dot value. That should be okay. Um and then we add that and then we append that to the form data. So I'll just explain something real quick before we leave this. When you have multiple inputs to a function, we know that in any programming language, you have a function and then you have that signature, right? So mm -hmm. you have like your arguments, they have to be in the right order. And so when you're dealing with something like this over the web, if we just say, hey, go get a bunch of images, they're all going to come back at different speeds and that's going to break. So what we do here is we have this convention in the second state infrastructure where we just simply underscore with a number and then it will arrange those in the right order. So I'm, I'm explicitly saying underscore one and then I'm giving it that particular URL. And if we just pop over to the Rust, just have a, a real quick look. Yep. Yep. So we, we sort of got this agreement. It's like a convention where the function is called thumbnail and it takes one argument. So I'm saying in the HTML, that this is underscore one. Now, if we had two arguments, like say we were watermarking an image and we had text as well or something, the second argument would be the text. So the Rust is expecting that. So what I do in the HTML is say input underscore two. The input is irrelevant. It's just the two that matters. So as long as there's like one, two, three, four on the end, mm -hmm. um, it'll know, oh, this is the order of the arguments that need to go and be sent over to the Rust. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You're just you're using like that cool. incremental IDs convention for the the, the yeah. functionality, right? So does that yeah. mean that we need yeah. to change this image to be load from memory to load from URL or something? Because that surely No, not, not at all. No, it'll it'll send it to the um the function as a service system will go and do that for us. There's two there's two ways you can do it. One, you can if we pop back to the HTML Mm -hmm. The one way you can do it is you can do a like a, a post request. And the other way, if you just put in a URL, it will just go and fetch that. And so the, the convention for this is if you put, see where it says input underscore one on that line you're on now. Mm -hmm. If you, um, constant URL equals, yeah. So if you put um, the word fetch underscore as a prefix, uh, 
yeah, prefix. Ah, right. and, and so fetch underscore input underscore one. Yep, fetch underscore input underscore one. Now what it's saying is, oh, hey, this isn't just text. I want you to actually go get this. And this is our convention that we created. So now it knows to actually go and get the image and bring it back as, as a raw image data. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's and, good. <laughs> and that should work. Now I'll just I'll just get you an image. If you go back to the GitHub with the links, mm -hmm. um, maybe just scroll up. I've just like plonked an image up here uh, in the um, there's like a remote image underscore one up the top there as like a JPEG. If you click on that, um, click on the download button. Yep. I, I think if you actually click on it because you, you need the raw um, image. Yeah. And then take that URL. Does that say raw dot GitHub? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So that, if we paste that in the text box, it will actually just go and get the, the images raw bytes. Well, we'll have to deploy this first, right? Um, just have to, you'll actually just have to click save on the HTML because we're not actually changing the Rust at all. Oh, so you just want and, me to open this HTML file? <laughs> yeah, just on your desktop. Yeah. So just save the HTML and just open it on your locally on your PC. And this is where the Jamstack thing comes in. You don't actually have to deploy it. It doesn't have to be served. It will just work. Yeah, there is a way to open this in my browser, isn't there? Uh, da, da, da. I'm sure I've done this before. Mm -hmm. I'll just do it from here. So well, this was the image thumbnail. So open yeah. image thumbnail, HTML, index. Um, looks like bitcdn.net might be a little slow. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, oh, yeah, cool. Um, so do we have a text box then? Do we do that? Yep. Oh, cool. Okay. And then hopefully if you hit that, it'll... Ta -da. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so what right. that's done is your computer has only sent that text like in the HTTP request, you sent that text that you've pasted in the server side's gone off to GitHub, got the image, come back, run the thumbnail, and then just sent you back the thumbnail only. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like how I, I, the JavaScript is just, you know, a very thin layer on making like an interface to the actual back end code and then you've got these conventions of fetch input which tells yeah second state to hey you want to go grab this link and send it into the rest function so that's yeah, yeah i quite like that it's very cool. there's other things uh similar so you can do uh callbacks so after a function executes you can put in the header or the body or actually you can submit a call back into the system. There's like a few different ways to do everything because we just try to be as flexible as possible. And what that'll do is it will execute a function. And then when the function's finished, it will perform a callback. So it will kind of call back on itself and do more stuff. So like you could maybe now send a text through uh, a service or, you know, send an email or something like that. Say your image is ready or what have you. Can I use that? So is, that is that callback the same way you would recommend to do like functional composition of chaining more than one second state function together or is there another primitive yeah. for that no exactly that yeah that's exactly right yeah so you'd have um we have a convention with which is ssvm callback and if you put that in the header and you put in a json object which is a callback so you have like host port um body it'll actually perform that when it'll wait and say okay do all your stuff and then the result comes back and then it goes, oh, hang on, I've got a call back and then we'll do that on the end and then send you back the result. Um, so things like, you know, you might, oh, and there's also a prefetch as well. So you'll do like, um, maybe go check a price of a stock or something and then, then calculate some change with Rust. And then when it's finished, then maybe the callback converts it from British pounds to Australian dollars or whatever, and then it will send that back to you. So you can do a bunch of different things. It's sort of like programming the web with WebAssembly is... All right. <laughs> yeah. so I, I guess I've got an idea then. I, I, maybe a 
I'll throw this out here. You can guide me away from it if you want. But if we wanted to show the functional composition, I believe you've already deployed the anagram finder to second state. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So so could we then write a page like this that takes a string input and we just have a really simple function that trimmed a space and then forward that onto the anagram finder and then give us a list of the potential anagrams? Yes. (laughs) So if we go to the anagram finder, I think I linked to that on the GitHub page with the raw code links. Yeah, which I think I've now went away from. Um, Let me just pull that back. I think there's a demo there. Let me just close a few of these tabs actually before I get to Okay, sure. (laughs) Oh, I like that log one north. Let's keep that up. Uh, yeah the log's cool okay so anagram let's pop you open mm-hmm. i think that's the article i wrote all oh, right okay okay so but that's cool yeah there's there'll be a link at the bottom there somewhere yeah i'll put this article in the show notes as well cool, cool. thanks i was just trying to give examples um i saw you guys do that and i'm like this is brilliant because that would be a killer app for a <laughs> For a trivia night or for a... <laughs> oh yeah, it's, yeah. So, uh, so we can see here cater comes back as trace. Trace, yeah. So what and happens what there is if, if I sorry go? I'm just gonna add some spaces. That should break it, right? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so spaces at the start, spaces at the end, we've broken the anagram, but we actually want this to work. So I was like, can we just throw together something that takes this input and then chain like strip, strips the spaces or non alphanumerics, whatever we want to do? And then pass it on sure. to the anagram finder. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So we're <laughs> going to write a new Rust function that strips the spaces, and we deploy that as a new WASM ID. We call that, and then when that's finished, then we're going to come back and and then do this. Yeah, that that we can do that. Yeah. That okay. Yeah. You think we could do that in half an hour? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. And um, yeah, sure. So yeah. why don't we just start with like something, I know this is, it seems almost mm-hmm. trivial, but let's say I want to create a new second state function that just takes a string, strims the spaces and spits it back out. What, what's the, how do I do that? Um, so we would. Unless you have any cooler demos, by the way, that shows off. This. Well, yeah. So basically what we do is we'd, instead of using the, the pre-written demos that we've got, we just do a cargo new and, um, you know, we, we just write a, a Rust function that does that, but I do actually have something really cool to show you. I don't know how long it will take. Um, but it's, it's super cool because it solves one of the problems that WebAssembly. well, it's not a problem, but it's just like a nuance of WebAssembly and it's, um, persistence. Cause one of the things with WebAssembly is it executes in a stateless environment. So essentially when you call a function, it creates a new instance of the VM, the stack and it executes and then when it's finished the stack the the instance of the vm's destroyed and it's gone and so that runs by itself in a standalone sandbox environment and then when it's done it's gone forever and that's a cool safety feature and that's the fundamentally what WebAssembly, uh, how it works but what you don't have is any persistence so to write anything useful if you're going to execute a function and then it just disappears and you and then you have no persistence then you can't really write an application so what we created was a storage mechanism to have persistence and i'd love to show you that if that's okay yeah that's it's really cool yeah. <laughs> okay um so there is a hello world called i think it's called hello storage let's see uh it is indeed so pop that open And so what this Rust does, um, do you mind me sort of diving a bit deep into like how we did this? No, go for it. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, cool. So essentially what we did was the WebAssembly VM is written in C++ and we're compiling Rust to WebAssembly and the WebAssembly VM only deals in its native... um, you know, data types. And one of those is the I32, right? So what we did was we wrote a library in Rust and put it in crates. 
that takes any high level rust data type like string structs doesn't matter and it serializes it to i32 and then what we're able to do is have the WebAssembly VM chew that and process it because it's it's saying here have a bunch of i32s do stuff with them and what we did was we used the foreign function interface so between rust and c++ to actually say here's a high level rust object i've converted it to a whole bunch of i32s here they all are i want you to take those verbatim and shove them into your memory and then what we did was which, which we're basically going to show here is you can go and you can go and fetch them and bring them back. So this this persists, um, but went a step further, which is even cooler. Instead of just doing that with like you know, um, here's some stuff I want you to store it and give me back a key, we actually using the Rust standard env. So you program like you would here, and you don't have to actually manage any keys. It's just if your application, like if your function endpoint is deployed at wasm id number one and you put some data into that it will just persist and then when you come back like a year later and say give me back my data it'll say there you go and just give it straight back to you so it's it's really it's a fantastic solution to persistence in rust WebAssembly toolchain. does that make sense am i explaining that yeah let me try and summarize that back for you then so sure I am familiar with the fact that WebAssembly only speaks uh, with, with arrays of bytes, all right? So you've got to run that problem by providing a serialization layer that actually allows you to work with native Rust objects and types, and then SSVM handles the translation. What's really yeah. cool, though, is that you're handling or providing persistence across runs by just allowing mm -hmm. the programmer to use environment variables. And then yep. the SSVM is actually going to say, oh, there's a new environment variable in this execution. I'm going to go store, store it somewhere. And then the next time they come back, that WASM ID allows that state to be then pulled back in from whatever storage backend has been provided. Again, by just saying here, there's an environment variable that's available to you. So they don't have to worry about files. They don't have to worry about anything like that. It's just really simple. Exactly. Very yeah. convenient. No, you don't have to worry about <laughs> databases or anything like that. And yeah, that's exactly right. So the um, the VM disappears. It's done. It's gone. When you call that function again, a new VM comes up. It's spawned out of nowhere. However, it says, oh, you've got some data here. Would you and like it? Are those keys mutable over time? I can modify them in any execution? There is two modes. So the top one is mutable and the bottom examples are immutable so the the top we can do it do you want to do you want to call this yes <laughs> let's do it cool okay so if we go to um the github page which has the so that the wasm learning hello storage i think there's some like cool commands in there we can actually we can actually use this yes so and we can we can right. definitely do this in half an hour we could like we could do all this so uh, second state as I'm learning. Yeah. Uh, so Vignesh has said it's kind of like Cloudflare workers. I'm yeah. not actually familiar with Cloudflare workers, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so do, hello, story. There we go. Yeah. Uh, cool. da, da. Yeah. Okay, so let's build it. Yeah. Storage. And then we curl this with our ID. Uh -huh. Oh, no, that's the deploy. Okay, got it. Yeah. I'll just give Rusty a couple of, a couple of hours of catch up. Yeah. So what's actually powering that storage on the, on the back end? Uh, RocksDB. RocksDB. Nice. Yeah. And we just um, transacting back and forth um, in its native um, binary format. So we're not converting anything to strings or doing any like cumbersome conversions. We just take the high level thing, we serialize it, and just pump it straight into rocks. And rocks takes whatever you give it. So, so <laughs> and then when you say, it just hands it back to you. So. If I wanted to store like a, 
you know, like a, an image, would I have to base encode that first, or is that something that would be handled? Uh, no, you just would. Um, you would just send it as raw bytes, and Rocks right. would just take it as raw bytes and just say thanks. Um, the if you want to have a, a real quick look, I, I wrote um, a piece of software which makes this possible. Um, sorry, I'm interrupting now. Maybe we no, just okay, do this. And, um, it, back in that um, raw code links, there's a um, there's a uh, uh, go down a bit. I think. Um, oh yeah, the serialize deserialize the crate. So that's basically what, because you know how you can serialize anything to like U8. Yeah. yeah. So you just get like a byte array. What this does is it takes that byte array and it turns it into a WASM variables. So a whole bunch of WASM variables and it will safely do that back and forth for you. So that's what, that's the, like the link that makes this possible to, yeah. to the WASM VM. So the WASM VM says, oh, I understand that give me all those i32s i'm going to do put them into rocksdb and then when they come back out again it gives them back and then this part of it turns it back into the byte array which then obviously the the higher level um, can understand like an image you know it says oh i'm an image you know once you go to display that so there's like this middle section that, which is what you're looking at now okay so let me pop back to uh okay got another question from vignesh what if the value is larger than a gigabyte <laughs> um it, it does up to four gigabytes at the moment is the the storage limit is four gig yeah that's quite generous up to four gig <laughs> yeah yeah all right we got our id so now i can st store a string inside of this yeah so our yeah. id is three two eight yeah so let's store hello everyone. And I always like to throw emojis into the mix here. So let's get uh nice. let's put in a <laughs> theory. There we go. Oh my let's terminal doesn't make it. And three two eight. Yeah. Okay. okay. Done. Cool. Okay. Now we interestingly Correct. Now that's the mutable. Uh, so if you do another one, it'll give you back a different key. And now you can have this whole array of like, if you're doing this programmatically, you can store all these in an array and have all this data that you can call by keys and they'll all, they'll refresh the keys for you. And, and you can update the data at a key, um, but you can also generate new keys and things like that. So this is one modality. And so this isn't using the. Sorry. <laughs> yep, so I guess I guess I'll I'll let you do the. All right. Okay. The demo. Yeah, and then. I actually got the fairy back, so that's good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. And so now, if we do the standard end like if we scroll down there's a different demo i'll just go to it as well so i can see it um, storage okay so we called store a string and now i can call store a string via standard n yeah okay so if i just let's say uh, change this one, mm -hmm. what was it? Store a string via standard um, env. Via std, yeah, via underscore std underscore env. Yeah. All right. And then let's add another emoji. So hello, and yeah. we'll, st we'll stick in a wave. Cool. And we get a different ID. So this is our wave fairy. Now you don't need to store that ID. It just returned it because it could. Um, oh. that will always be the same because that's, that was a my D standard end signature. That's, that's persistent. That's, um, immutable essentially. Ah, that's gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So you, so you don't have to manage keys is, is essentially what's happening. Yeah. 
Okay. You can manage them, but you don't have to. If you use standard end, but just it's just there when the VM spawns, it's your data's just sitting there waiting for you. So does that mean if I take off that parameter and just modify the function call here, do I get that back? Uh, yeah, I'll just check if that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on one sec. Um, so load a string and yes oh i beg your pardon so i'm in the wrong spot uh load a string yes just do just do no header either just nothing because you're not actually putting anything in so just uh the post and then stop after the function name and that should be we're fairly there we go yeah and you said that and you can put anything in there like a json object or a image or a so that can be like that function as a services standard end storage. Um, you, you might want to parse JSON. So when it comes back out, you might want to like crack it open with cert and say, you know, give me all the keys or whatever. It doesn't have to be just text. <clears throat> it could be okay. a struct. So it's it's yeah. not immutable because I think I just modified it. But it, the the key is fixed. It's what the, the value is. There. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So you're not managing keys at all. It just is. It just it's just some data that you've got access to by standard end. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I understand that now. So I can use that function, use the environment to store it. So whatever calculation, whatever I need to process, and then the next time I call it, I can pull it out, pull it out as often as I yeah. need. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. I like yeah. that. We have another feature as well, which may or may not be useful. It's called ephemeral storage. And it's really easy to use. You don't have to write any Rust or do anything. It's just an endpoint. If we go to that um, jam-packed API, we can have a quick go of that. And I'll just explain that in a bit more detail about why it exists. And because yeah. storage is a big deal, I guess, um, you know, given that the the WebAssembly VM is stateless, that's. Uh, so if we go down to one of the put i think it's a put request i'll just open mine up so we can see there's oh. callbacks um, um, post. ephemeral storage there we go ephemeral storage yeah you got that okay so there is a i think there might be one up from that it might be a post I just need to find it. Sorry, I'm on. Yep, post. There you go. There's a post? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, cool. So if you post the raw data, so I guess you could just do that, like literally paste that in your... Cool. So that's giving you back a key. So if you now take that key and do the next command, using by passing in that key. Now, this is just a, as a rest endpoint. You're just sort of putting the key on the end of the URL. You're not actually doing anything with complex headers or bodies or anything. Yep, worked. Cool. And what will happen if you do nothing else, that will disappear in exactly one hour. But if you do anything to it, like update it or touch it or whatever then it will persist so it's just like this additional feature which is right up at the top of the api stack if you will and it's for iot devices and things like that like if you've got a temperature sensor that's just um, recording like once per second and you you kind of want it's almost like cache like buffering and then so you're not writing any rust or doing any sort of low level stuff it's just right up at the at the api um, level and then you can use those keys to you you might want to consolidate a whole bunch of information over the course of like 30 minutes and then do something with that it's just to stop the developer from having to write rust to do everything and deploy things and it's just like a high level convenience storage um yeah. because of the fact that you were we're dealing in a stateless environment it sort of makes it a bit trickier to, to write an app so <laughs> i think those last two examples are there's something really subtle there, right? But I want to kind of call it out is that with the storage, with the save and storing thing from the first example and with this ephemeral storage that has an hour, I mean, essentially I could use these as 
a database, a key value database. And the latter one functioned very similar to something like Redis with a time to live on that cache value as well. Um, exactly. I mean, even if I don't use any other of the functions of the service, which is also really cool, is that I have a key value Redis available to me on second state virtual machine for yeah, free over the within web. the rate limits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I guess the only catch is um, like if you could guess that key, then you could see the data, but that's going to be pretty tricky because uh, it's open. So, yeah, I mean, I could, I could use, I mean, I didn't have to use the, I mean, it's a UUID. It's like it's, secure in a, yeah. a weird way <laughs> but it would be quite difficult yeah, yeah. to start getting it, well I, I guess i guess you'd hit if someone was trying to just brute force keys they'd hit the right limit right so <laughs> well, yeah i'm not saying i would use this storage as my you know one password replacement or anything like that where i just think yeah. oh my uuids can store my passwords so uh, yeah yeah th that would be a cool hackathon so, project actually <laughs> um, yeah yeah uh, that's really cool i like that I've covered so much. Like I can write Rust code, compile it to Wasm, and store it, and it's always available over an HTTP endpoint. And then beyond yeah. that, you've already got these pre-canned functions which are deployed for ephemeral storage, and I can use persistent storage. Are there any yeah. guarantees on the persistent storage for my application? Like, could I or should I expect that to disappear at any point? Uh, it's you know technically it's forever because the system will run and continue to function and the the information goes through into the rocks db and it will be there when you come back that that's the the premise you know that's the um all, all things being equal it's that 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 functionality is intended so yeah um Okay, it's a random question. Who provides the compute? Is this sponsored by Second State? Are you providing all the compute power here? Or is this where the blockchain comes in and other people are providing compute? Is this distributed on the back end? Do you want to give me a little bit of information on yeah, that? Yeah, so, so that's essentially the next step is to, we've come up with a plan where not only is it um, feasible for for us to host this because we have this the statistics like the gas and the metering and things like that any app developers who want to build upon this they can also talk to their investors and say you know i've written a few hundred lines of rust here's some html and some javascript here's what it looks like and here's what the users would do to convert their menus to english or whatever whatever usage use case they have and then, um, you know, what's it going to cost me, says the investor. Well, it'll cost you, you know, two cents per or, you know, or point zero something cents per use. And so, it, you know, if the, if the application, if the web application users are paying a dollar for the app or something, then you're going to cover those costs. So the, the business model is sound in that we have a mechanism to meter and charge. And but that's really the implementation of that is coming. We've built out as flexible infrastructure as possible so that we can do stuff and the the machine learning and ai and all the tensorflow um and and the rust components and uh all of that sort of those prototypes are just trying to demonstrate that you can build a lot of cool stuff on this it's kind of up to your imagination really as to what you can build um I've tried to write articles and you know like the end like that's cool I could do that that that's easy but you could come up with some really nifty stuff and build it out in like no time and and it would be fairly cheap to run yeah there's no doubt that the WebAssembly vm's very powerful oh probably the most important thing i should mention is we're not running just in time compile the native WebAssembly executable that gets uploaded we actually our developers have written so we actually convert that to aot compiled which is why it's so fast and there was an article um, just published, um, which I can send you and, and you can link to that about the benchmarking between the second state Wasm VM and the other runtimes and the other VMs. And our AOT compiling component means that our stack, like our execution is blisteringly fast. So the, the, the latency across the network is really the, the biggest thing that we're seeing. Um, and the other, the other cool part about this, um, the SSVM up, tool is basically it's based on wasm pack but we're not just writing this for like the web or for the for the browser we're taking this onto the server side so you can do all of this 
on the server as well, like even in the command line. So no API, no web, just if you have like a factory or some sort of closed um, environment where you just want really powerful execution, you can just do that on like directly on the server by installing the SSVM on on that machine and, and executing that. We're trying to cover off all the different areas. This open API is essentially giving end users access to the back end through the open web. But you can you can run this stuff just straight out on the on the server if you want. Like literally command line and pass in a big file and do whatever you want to it. Awesome. I mean, there's just so much flexibility and options to the way I interact, engage, and kind of compose these things together. Like you, you can do a lot with this. Is yeah. Is there anything you want to show before we finish up for today? Is there anything that we've missed that you'd like to? Um. I don't think so. I think that's that's a fairly good. Yeah, we've done remote fetching and we've done storage and yeah i think that's that's a good yeah we, 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 we've covered a lot i mean we we had yeah. some rust code we built it we deployed it we yeah. upgraded it we then interacted yeah. with it through really simple html with a little bit of javascript we covered the semantics around how the inputs with the numbers work we covered fetching there's just so much there and then the state the ephemeral storage interacting with the environment so much good and, there for people so. and we covered the um security aspect so it can be a private function or you can open it up have it public but you can choose to toggle between those two with just a simple request so that's that's a big part of it i think too is yeah i think code reuse is interesting because um you know the dry print principle and kiss yeah. principle and all these things that you learn we really, we really shouldn't have to write like a, a basic example, like, you know, Fahrenheit to Celsius or something that should only probably exist in one place, right. Um, or any sort of decent function, uh, that exists. It'd be amazing if instead of people writing that separately, if it was in here and someone could improve on it, they could come and have a look at the rust source code, make a change, improve it, prove that it's more efficient or whatever, and then get approval to update it that was my idea and then that's like your superior uh function for that purpose in the world and, and but that's not reality is it <laughs> i've got a, a really cool hack project for us to maybe work on if we if we have the time where i would really love to see like, can i add arbitrary headers to my function deployment like as metadata uh to the rust or to the yeah so if i write a function um yeah. can i describe that to second state somehow can i you know like if i wanted to add an intent header uh, ssvm underscore intent so it just resizes images oh, and then could yeah. i then provide a yeah. function which did discovery via that metadata to actually build out that intent system on second state? Yeah. i think that would be really cool um, yeah yeah absolutely we could definitely accommodate that and i think it would be great if you had a place where you could go to shop for functions or functionality yeah. and and then you could like rate it, you know, this is the best temperature <laughs> conversion function because of whatever reason. And, you know, you're sort of like building up a, um, what would you call it? Um, what's that a restaurant app where you Yelp or something? You know? Yeah, yeah. Yelp, yeah. Yelp code. <laughs> that, right. that would be brilliant. You go <laughs> shopping for a function, you know, what's, what's the best OCR function? Test it out. Yeah, that works. Plug it into your app it's and really then give it five stars and. Yeah. I, th I think me as a, as a developer, right, especially if I'm leveraging a platform like this, and I say, oh, I really wish I could translate this from English to French. And I I, I shouldn't have to write that again. Other people yeah. that have done it, they should exactly. expose it as a translator with languages that they support. And then I just call it and I can pick one yeah. I like, or I could just tell the intent system, hey, I, I want to translate. I don't really care which one you use, go do it. And like, um, lots there i'm not exactly. going to try and drag us into a different conversation right now but i think we should continue this offline at some point and um, we do yeah. have one more question from our audience Vignesh is back again thank you man for the questions keep them coming is the function deployed globally so you know i'm in scotland right now where where is this being served from because the latency has been quite good actually yes it is deployed globally yes and at the moment we're just running this from the united states and so me calling it from australia i generally find it's you know when we take talking millisecond execution on the vm I, i'm finding like a second to me seems like a long time 
Um, but when I but when I deploy it in Sydney, it's super fast for me. So it's it's really the latency. But yeah, it is global. Yeah, and um, we're setting up uh, another server, uh, another uh, lot of infrastructure at the moment, which I'm going to do, which is um, inside China. So that's just doing it on a different platform. Yeah. So awesome. All right. Well. Uh... That was really great. Um, I really loved learning about Second State, and I can see so much potential and how other people can leverage it and and use it. And uh, I, I can't wait to kick the tires on it a little bit more. So, uh, do awesome. you have any yeah. final thoughts before we finish for today? Um, no, I'm all good. <laughs> all right, I'm well, good. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. It's been really great, fun. Uh, no, thank you. I, I know you stayed up really late. It's getting to what probably half eleven at night for you. So you know, yeah. thank you for taking the time, joining me today, walking me through this. I had an absolute blast, and uh, we'll chat Please. again soon. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Bye. Bye.